helping us. Thank you for being right here with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you, James, James, and Aaliyah. I guess I could say James Squared and Aaliyah. And just so that you know, we have a principal of the year in our midst, James Garrett. Congratulations. That's a big deal. So congratulations. It's good to be back here in our church. Last week, I was over at Bayshore Bible, and Dr. David Lewis was right here in our church. We got to swap churches, and it was a good experience for me because I got to tell them what a blessing they have been to us. Early on, they were one of the, I think, the first church here in our church helping us. They actually led music uh, for us for a couple weeks, and uh, they were over in our youth building, cutting out, tearing down, trying to get it uh, just cleaned up a little bit so people could go in and rebuild. So they were a huge blessing to us right after the storm and uh, gave me an opportunity to share that with them. Uh, and my intention after last Sunday was to come back here and preach the same sermon I preached over there. And after praying about it and sensing from God that I need to go a different route, that that's okay so I had to file that one away and maybe on the Harvey anniversary I don't know how you say that but you know may, maybe when we go through that I'll, I'll preach that sermon if God allows but for today we're going to talk about contentment and the music we sang went right with the sermon I mean right with it so I want to start with the question what is going through your mind right now what are you thinking about what do you think about what you need to do when you get home? Is it about construction and crews and insurance? Is it about trying to get things cleaned up, trying to get caught up? There's, there's a lot that goes into this, isn't it? I've, for years, I've watched the Weather Channel and watched hurricanes and just been in awe of them. But after they go through, it's like, well, nobody talks about it anymore. No one tells you what's going on after the storm. And the struggles that go on day after day. Right after Harvey and after we got a roof repaired and, and were able to come back into our building, we went through a, ser a series on anxiety in our small groups. And to a person, I think everyone said that was right what I needed, exactly on time. It applied to me. But I don't know about you, but for me, I found myself getting right back into my anxious ways. It's easy to do. And so today's topic and sermon on contentment really is right in line with that whole thought process on anxiety. And I realize we have a lot of people here that aren't uh, from Port A and haven't gone through the storm. Maybe this hits you in another area of lack of contentment or, or too much anxiety. Well, I want us to look at Philippians chapter 4, 10 through 20. And we'll go ahead and read that passage, and I'll go back. Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. This is Paul writing to the church at Philippi, which is in Asia Minor, Minor Greece, Turkey area, and it was a major commercial hub and crossroads that people went through at the time. Not that I, verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Verse 16, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, 
a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, to really get this passage, we need to understand Paul's situation in writing this. So all the way over in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, he says, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened. I think I have, there it is, right there. I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So what's happened to Paul that advances the gospel of Jesus? So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Most theologians agree that Paul was under house arrest, probably in Rome, when he wrote this around A.D. 61. So about 30 years after the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So there were people still alive who had seen Jesus resurrected. Maybe not exactly in Philippi, but at least they had heard about it. Maybe they knew someone who saw Jesus. So Paul was imprisoned house arrest at this time now let's go back through this and let's remember what paul had just read in chapter four he says i know in whatever situation it, i am to be content matter of fact verses 11 and 12 not that i am speaking of being in need for i have learned in whatever situation i am to be content i know how to be brought low in other words i know how to have very little i've i've been through that I know what it means to have almost nothing to my name. And I know how to abound. In, in other words, I know that, what it's like to have a lot. I've had a lot. I know both situations. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This word content comes from a Greek word called autarkes, which means self-sufficient, satisfied, and independent. This is the only occasion that this word shows up in the New Testament. So what we know from Paul, because we've read verse 13 already, is that he's not saying that my contentment is, not, is based on me, myself, and I. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is something completely different using this word. And he's changing the meaning, really, of this word. He's saying it, it's not based on himself. His contentment is with himself as he relates to the indwelling power of God inside of him. So verse 12 says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. In other words, Paul is saying that his contentment is not based on his possessions or his situation, but on the condition of his heart. Let's stop right there. Let's let that marinate in our minds for a moment. Our contentment, and what I'm saying here for believers, is anti Americana. It's an anti-American society. We see something and we say, well, I've got to have that. So we order it immediately or we go get it immediately. And we wait for two-day shipping. We think that's too long. And, and then we, we say, okay, this, this is nice. I like it. But then three weeks later, we're not happy with it. We get so discontent with every little thing. And I'm... I'm saying we for a reason, because it's me too. So Paul is saying that his contentment is not based on his possessions or his situation, but on the condition of his heart, which is trusting in God to take care of him. And then we get to verse 13. Maybe one of the most out-of-context verses we use now that we put it in context it says i can do all things through him who strengthens me now that can apply to all kinds of situations 
But the context of which Paul is using this is I've been in jail, I've been beaten, I've been whipped, I've been near death multiple times, I've had multiple trials, I've had people throw rocks at me and try to kill me. And I know what it's like to have nothing, I know what it's like to have a whole lot, but I've learned the secret of all this. And I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In other words, I can be content regardless of exterior situations regardless of what's happening right in front of me i can look beyond that and see that there's a bigger picture paul gets his strength he gets his contentment because of jesus christ because of the holy spirit specifically to be theologically accurate because of the holy spirit inside of him he has learned to be content no matter the situation, no matter what he has or doesn't have, no matter who's sitting next to him, no matter where, where he is. Then verses 14 through 18. Let's look at this for a moment. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. Let's have a little Paul history here. Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, and then after that he went away to, to a region, learned. He went over to Macedonia. Christians were still skeptical because they remembered Saul, the guy who tried to kill Christians and who successfully killed Christians and took many to prison, and they were still wondering, is this... A facade is this a ruse is this some kind of scheme to get more Christians to go into jail so many churches were standoffish held Paul who used to be Saul at arm's length but the church at Philippi they were the first ones to say you know what we sense from God that this is real we're gonna support you in this you're making disciples you want to make disciples no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. Verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again, so multiple times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. This is why here at First Baptist, when we say that the New Testament teaches sacrificial giving, this is one of the things we go back to right here, where Paul says the church in Philippi gave sacrificially to his needs and to what he needed to further the gospel. Now, let me brag on our mission team for a moment. We have a mission team that doesn't just throw money around at anyone and says, hey, I'm going off to a foreign land. And we don't know if they're actually preaching the gospel or if they're on a beach sipping a Mai Tai or something. We don't know. But they specifically target ministries that are ministries that aren't just preaching the gospel, but they're ministries where they make disciples to then make more disciples. It's a multiplica multiplication factor involved in it. And so we don't send money all over the world. I think we've targeted, what, five or six specific ministries and we understand that our resources are not great in regard to other churches yet we want to be as much of a blessing as we can with that and so we get that principle right here but Paul is telling the Philippian believers that he appreciates everything that they've done but his contentment isn't based on donations he says i don't look for the gift but i look for the blessing that you get from the gift from being the giver of the gift and then verses 19 and 20 and my god will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in christ jesus to our god and father be glory forever and ever amen for my god will supply every need of yours 
here's where the rubber meets the road in our own mind thought process. What does it mean to be content? Well, let's ask ourselves some questions here. Who has allowed our situation, whether you're from Port A or you're from somewhere else, who has allowed your current situation? God has. God has allowed it. Harvey wasn't a surprise to God. God didn't all of a sudden look at the radar and say, oh, I didn't see that happening. That did okay, God knew about Harvey. Who has provided for us in the past? All right, you're catching on. Very good. Do we have any reason to believe that God has decided not to provide? No, none at all. Now, this is not on the screen, but if you have something to jot it down or just text it to yourself, that's fine. The lack of godly contentment is a symptom of a lack of faith and trust in God. And when I put that down in my notes, I thought, ouch, that hurts. I don't like to hear that from myself. For me, the lack of godly contentment is a symptom of a lack of faith and trust in our God and our Father. Paul is telling those who are giving to him to be content with what God has given to you because God will provide. So what is the condition of your heart as it relates to contentment? Have you been discontent lately? Maybe a whole lot of discontentment. This is our bottom line. Contentment is not about what I have or don't have. It's not about what you have or don't have. It's a matter of trust in God to do what he has always done. Let's say that again. Look at it on the screen with me. Contentment is not about what I have or don't have. Think about that for a second. We can go through a, a litany of things that we've lost in the storm, we're upset about, we're mad about maybe past relationships, uh, maybe it's nothing storm related, but it's a relationship issue or a work-related issue, and there's just a whole storm of discontentment resting over your head. You know, those little cartoon bubbles, lightning striking, you just see that person is upset about something. And spiritually speaking, that just defines where you're at right now. It's not a matter of what I have or don't have. It's a matter of my trust in God to do what he has always done. So let's dig into this just for a second here before we move on to our Lord's Supper. What specifically is the root of my discontentment? That's what I want you to ask yourself. Where is this coming from? And this may not be something that you can immediately fill in the blank. You may need to go home and pray about this and ask God, Father, would you prompt the Holy Spirit to show me where the root of my discontentment is? Am I angry with God that I've had to go through this? You know what? I think if we're honest, there's some of that in all of us at one time or another. David was angry at times with God. Read the book of Psalms. God, where are you? I don't see you anywhere in this. But then you keep reading. You say, oh, there you are. I see your bigger plan now. Okay, I'm all right. I just had it to express myself for a second and we can do that god is comfortable enough with this uh, you know being our creator i think he can handle that just let you know what specifically is the root of my discontentment then ask god to help you to trust him to resolve this discontentment Even if you have, there's a time, an appropriate time, where often God will give us a godly discontentment. So your discontentment may not be an ungodly discontentment. It may not be Harvey-related. There may be a godly 
discontentment in your heart where you sense that God's not happy with maybe something going on at work, something going on with some friendships that you have, or a relationship that, that is yours, yet there's a godly discontentment. Because you know something's not right there. And the Holy Spirit may be prompting you to go to the, uh, another person and say, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Let's sit down. Let's resolve this in a godly manner. Instead of posting and all this other stuff, let's just talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. Let's talk about what's going on. I, I sense something's wrong. Maybe it's my end, maybe it's your end, maybe it's both of us, but let's talk. Oftentimes, God will place a godly discontentment in believers to resolve injustice. Philippians 4.11, the second half. For I have learned in whatever situation I am in, I am to be content. As the body of Christ, are we exercising our faith muscles so that our community sees who our faith is in? So, FBC Port A, do those around us and our community here, do they see us exercising our faith muscles? say our faith is in our God this wasn't a surprise to him he will provide he will use us at times to be the hands and feet of Jesus to help provide we need to be all about that but our community needs to see who our faith is in 1st Timothy 6 6 through 8 it's not on the screen but I want to close with this before we get to the Lord's Supper but godliness with contentment is great gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Wow. There's all kinds of Holy Spirit conviction that can happen in our minds and hearts right there. Paul, who was in jail, beaten, says, I've learned the secret of this. It's not about the exterior circumstances. It's a heart issue. Let me ask you, bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. Before we have our gentlemen deacons come up and start administering the Lord's Supper, let's, let's pray. Let's do some business with God. I sense here that there might be many of us, whether it's Harvey related or something completely far away from Harvey, not Harvey related, there, there can be discontentment that breeds in us and we need to deal with that. So just in the quietness here, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to let you talk to God. And ask the Holy Spirit, what is the root of my discontentment?